So you are seeing the slide deck? Yes. Okay. Then, uh, welcome to my talk about infrastructure as code and action. Um, a story about how we built a custom cloud platform during a cloud migration with the help of infrastructure as code um, and predominantly with uh, Terraform. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Thorsten and I'm working also for Novatech as a IT architect or cloud architect or, well, you, you can call it whatever you want to. Um, I'm happy to build with my colleagues um, flexible cloud solutions. I'll skip this slide because my colleague also introduced you to, um, to our company and I can start over with our migration journey. So as I just said in, in the title, we have been submitted with a cloud migration and the application landscape which we are tasked to migrate was something we are, uh, we were developing for I think five years. It is a backend for a connected vehicle system. And I want to share some technical details with from that application. So we do have many codes, but much more requests based on three applications in three geographies, running a pretty old fashioned technology stack and con communicating to a lot of backend systems with different technologies. So storing data in a DB2 database, running and communicating uh, with JMS, REST and SOAP. And now it's interesting to see with which applications or which things this application is communicating. Just imagine this one as the customer data center where all those applications are being hosted and connected to this data center, you will find some plants or factories, some car dealers, your phone, your car itself or whatever. So for example, you can use your phone to tell your car that it should open the trunk or ask the car how many fuel is left. So, it was totally clear for us that not all parts of the application will be migrated to the cloud because some things like very, very old legacy systems will stay or will remain in the, in the customer data center itself. So we knew there would be something like this where we need to connect the cloud to, oh, to the data center and there will be some things which are only cloud available. Starting over with the, the, um, the old stack is the application running on Web3 application server on the customer data center or on our local operating system for developing purposes. And what we want to see in the future together with our customer was applications running as microservice on a managed cloud platform. Nobody is a operating guy um, or a, a operating operations engineer in our team. So we, we dreamt of having a managed cloud platform. But um, this was not just snapping a finger. We need to find a migration path there. And one step was changing the runtime from Web3 application server to IBM Web3 Liberty server, which is more designed for running inside a container. And once being in a container, we can shift through the platforms running, uh, um, finishing running on a managed cloud platform in a container and then migrate to microservice. So that, that was the high level plan. But just having that plan was not enough. We had a lot of questions and doubts. Um, 
since we did not know exactly what to do. Some of the questions were on what will it run? So we decided to bring our application on Rapture Liberty in a Docker container, but on what will it run? Will it be a VM on a cloud platform which has just running a Docker daemon, or will it be Kubernetes, will it be Cloud Foundry? Um, who will bring it there? Uh, it consists also of one terabyte of data, um, including personal identifier data. So it was kind of um, um, security related. Yeah? Uh, and how much power will it need to run? For example, will one or two VM be enough for handle all, all those traffic, which I just showed before? There were many questions. And the biggest question of all was how to maintain all those new technologies um, throughout any cloud pro provider. There were some point in time where we don't had much time left for theories and planning. We decided, well, we need to start over. And one part was collecting initial requirements. Requirements from the team, from, from the customer, from many persons. And what we found out is we need to run on Kubernetes and Docker. We need to use PostgreSQL or MySQL which means we need to migrate database from DB2 to MySQL or PostgreSQL. We need to be ready for high availability setups and must use Azure Public Cloud. Should prefer managed services and use Azure DevOps for CI CD tooling. And what I just said before is communication between the data center and the public cloud will still be um, we need it. But there, that's not enough. Uh, we should avoid a vendor login, uh, which is a very generally for, uh, formulated uh, requirement. We should encourage team self-service, which means there, sh there must not be one guy you need to ask for, I need a new database. We will stay with three geographies, but two stages each, a productive and a non-productive environment. And there are only six months, uh, six months left until the go live in Europe. So what we decided was um, we will build a custom cloud platform which fits exactly the applications we need. We will not design a cloud platform which uh, will be ready for every application. We will use one for exactly our applications in order to reduce also administrative efforts and um, being ready for enhancing or stripping the, uh, the, the big monolith into microservices. That was the purpose of our platform design. So we started with an early draft. The idea was using three Kubernetes, manage Kubernetes service on error, one in Europe, one in America, one, one in China, with a shared container registry with a shared key vault and some SQL databases and load balancers in between. A very basic setup, the traffic comes through the internet or through um, a VNet gateway into the cluster. So that was the, the early draft. What then happened was that our colleagues discovered, well, when we start to develop microservices and split the monolith into microservices, we can have a lot of more technologies. We can, for example, use content delivery networks, we can use Azure Functions, we can use blob storage or whatever. All those resources which are available on a cloud platform can be used in the future for our new application for our new microservices. So the, the picture became more complex. And what we need was something like a repro reproducible environment. We need to find a way to 
instantiate our environment for temporary, for testing purposes, throw it away, change something, reproduce it. So that was something which was urgently needed. That was the point when we decided to introduce uh, infrastructure as code. We said, well, we are sharing some infrastructure like the container registry or some um, general secrets and certificates. But everything else is independently uh, hosted in one environment. A environment in detail consists of a Kubernetes service, many databases, also replication databases for the customers, business intelligence tools, Azure Event Hubs for providing uh, capabilities for event-driven architectures based on Event, uh, event Hub. We are using functions and content, content delivery networks, Azure Insights for logging and monitoring purposes, and Vault for storing secrets and certificates for each application. So the Kubernetes cluster will run at least approximately 10 or 15 applications. Some of them are quite big and heavy and some of them will be very, um, very uh, lightful. So that was the plan. So while being on that, on that plan, we discovered many, many dif difficulties. This talk is just giving some examples, some, uh, something we remember most. Uh, this talk could also take for, uh, for many hours. Um, one part we, we, we do have uh, was bringing a taste of security into our, into our platform. As I just said, we do have personal identifiable information inside the databases. So restricting the database access is something very crucial for our platform. Um, luckily, the basic setup in Azure for Azure managed databases is really good. We do have mandatory IP whitelisting, author authentication, authorization, encryption in transit and rest, just out of the box. We also have something like advanced threat protection. So there, there is an uh, artificial intelligence which is introspecting the traffic through and uh, um, throughout the database and looking for something on an anomaly team. So the question was, well, is that enough? And just by asking this question for security, uh, the answer is most of the time, no, it isn't. We do have um, more use cases for database access. For example, engineers who are being on call need, might need to have access during a incident. Or business intelligence people, we fairly don't know, need to have access to the database. So what we need is a fine granular database access provisioning uh, process. It must be restrictable, auditable, and approvable. So we were looking for ideas how to implement that. And what we found out is that we can use Azure DevOps for creating a pipeline, very, um, very straightforward for that audit purpose. But the, what was just not okay is that the internet traffic can be routed to the database itself. What would be okay is put the database and Kubernetes in a, in a VNet in combination with a request process. That means nobody can connect from the internet without further steps to the database. As this talk is about, uh, about infrastructure as code, I'd like to show you how to do that with infrastructure as code. Um, you would need to define that this VNet should be whitelisted or access listed for the database. The problem is that this resource group 
uh, is not managed by Terraform. So what is this resource group about? A Kubernetes cluster consists of uh, different resources. And it is the fact that in Azure, the resources are collected in a managed resource group for the uh, Kubernetes cluster. What you do see, for example, here is a virtual machine. This is, this is a cluster with one node. It's the root table for the Kubernetes network stuff. And, and as the Kubernetes cluster grows up, there will be more resources. And what we are looking for is access listing this virtual network to the database only. The database should accept only requests from this network because that's the network where our applications reside in. So how to do that with Terraform? Um, there's just no way to access this resource group without uh, without scripting and you can besides on all those um, getting started and Terraform advanced um, sessions you need to learn something like external data sources or, or null resources so what is this snippet doing here this one is executing a bash script which is asking Azure CLI for please tell me the VNet name for those Kubernetes cluster. And once we have that, we can continue and create a SQL endpoint within that um, VNet. So what, what is a SQL endpoint? Um, within Azure, you can tell the platform that it should only access uh, SQL traffic within that VNet. So we are access listing SQL traffic also within that VNet. So this is a way to technically um, restrict traffic to database via Terraform reproducible in each stage. And once this is done, you can create a virtual network rule. This is um, default Terraform usage for the resource group for the, for the SQL server for this subnet. So once you have the subnet ID, you can tell your SQL server, you, you can just accept traffic from this VNet. Right, so this was challenge one. Um, you might remember that we have an application with a lot of traffic and we were just afraid of that the question how much power will it need to handle the traffic is still not answered yet and um it it wasn't answered we did have the problem that the the traffic which our application is causing to the database service was just too high um we could scale up the database engine, but that was just not the solution because the traffic which has been generated was from the, from the logical perspective, perspective just too much. So we resulted in too many outages. And what we found out during 24 seven on call is that we need to be informed if there's something suspicious going on. And we utilized infrastructure as code and Azure platform in order to get notifications if there's something ongoing. For example, we are getting hailed by, uh, by the platform if the CPU usage of the database server is too high per, per Slack message or per um, email. And I want to show you how we did that with infrastructure as code. Azure's Terraform provider allows you to define and manage many resources. One of them is Azure Monitoring Metric Alert. Um, the advantage we, ha we had is that, that we uh, heavily used Azure Insights, Azure Metrics, which are the managed services for logging and monitoring purposes. And why we did that, we could also define alerts. 
This one is notifying our team if the storage uh, is, uh, well, almost full. And if so, the team will decide what's to do. We could also set up that the storage will be increased, but um, it is probably um, not just the solution to increase the storage. Maybe there are too many things left which has to be uh, handled manually. Next step is getting high available. Well, that, that was one requirement which we collected. And the question is, um, if our Kubernetes cluster will, or our deployment will freeze or, or stop working, what will happen to the application landscape? We found out that, well, we remember that there was many traffic and that we probably need more than one cluster because our applications, uh, if one application goes down, it will force other applications to go down as well. And if we design the application landscape more flexible, we can shift over to uh, separ several deployments amongst many clusters. And what we use from infrastructure perspective is Traffic Manager, which enables us to define DNS-based load balancing across many regions. We decided to use Traffic Manager also for checking if the application is still available. Let's see how we did that. We created a, a profile which is checking if the application is healthy and if so, the traffic will be routed to one endpoint and with priority one. There will be another endpoint for, for example, in North Europe or region two, um, where the traffic will be routed if endpoint one is not available anymore. Well, next step was um, being live in Europe, being live in America. That worked, besides that traffic problem, it worked very good. What we didn't expect is that going live in China was that hard. Uh, I want to share some facts with you here. Um, within the two other geographies, we just need to change variables from West Europe to US East, for example. But there were many more things to do for China. And we knew that there's something like the Great Firewall, but we didn't know how this will affect on our application. The Chinese Azure instance has some more limitations compared to, to uh, the uh, global instance. For example, we cannot use Azure DevOps, which is our default tool for CI and CD purpose. We need a container registry proxy because you cannot reach, for example, Kubernetes Helm from gcr.io because gcr.io is Google container registry and you can just not reach that. There will be a higher latency from, for example, our pipeline host or my notebook to, uh, to, the, to the Azure China instance. That might be not a problem for in China, but if you're experimenting with how to deploy your application, uh, uh, how to deploy your infrastructure in China, you will face much more latency and much more time consumption while doing that because you are not sitting within, not sitting in China. There is no advanced threat protection for the databases or for the blob storages, for the storages accounts. And there's no encrypted data addressed. The thing which most applies to the infrastructure as code parties that the content delivery network template is just not the same as the rest of the world. And there's no documentation about that. So what we did is we built workarounds. There are two ways to, to use Terraform 
and Azure. You can use the Azure Resource Manager and the Terraform plugin. This is like default. You are defining a resource and apply that to, to Terraform. What Terraform will do is translate this language into Azure templates, which is the, the uh, Azure default deployment language, infrastructure deployment language. And the other way to do that is that you can define the template itself to Terraform. And that was the solution here. For within China, we need to translate our Terraform files for the content delivery network into templates and deploy that within China, uh, within the pipeline, only via templates. Right, so I, I need to bid a hurry up a bit. Um, I already mentioned Azure DevOps frequently. Um, what we did with Azure DevOps were creating a pipeline which automatically deploy infrastructure on any Azure instance and with audit table and approval steps, which means we will execute a plan before and if that's on prod, somebody can reject that. So somebody can be another team member, but not yourself. You can see, for example, on non-prod that the environments are being uh, consistently recreated on fully automatically. 